today we're talking about butts. That's right. More specifically, we're talking about a painful little problem that occurs at the very base of the spine in the gluteal cleft, the butt crack, called pilonidal disease. Now, this is a very common problem that occurs in young adults, and as a pediatric surgeon, I see two to three young people every week with this problem that ranges from simple pits to an abscess to chronically draining sinus tracts that can require pretty complex surgery. So today we're going to be talking about what pilonidal disease is, why it happens, and at the end of the video, I'm going to show you the very first steps in treatment. All right, let's go. Pilonidal disease is a painful problem that affects thousands of people every year. And as I said, it can range from a small dimple or little pits to abscesses and chronically draining sinus tracts that certainly require surgical intervention and debridement. And the question is, why does it happen? What are the risk factors for getting pilonidal disease? Is there anything we can do about it? And after treatment, how do we prevent it from coming back? At the end of the video, I'm going to talk about a paper that was just published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that demonstrates one simple and effective therapy that can be used to prevent recurrence of pilonidal disease. But first, what is it? Pilonidal disease, we can break it down by saying pilo means hair and nidal means nest. So it's a nest of hair, okay? And this frequently causes infection. Why is that? Well, it's because hair acts as a foreign body. Once it gets under the skin, your body mounts an immune response to try to get rid of it. And hair is not sterile. So hair has bacteria on it. And so when we get a foreign body with bacteria under the skin, we're going to have a high risk of infection. So pilonidal disease is a frequently encountered problem in young people, adolescents, and then those aged 20 to 30 is where it's most common. There is a range of incidents across the world. We see it as high as 6% of the population in Turkey, whereas it can be as low as 0.1% of the population in Germany. So quite a spectrum there. Well, why does it happen? If we want to get into why it happens first, let's take a look at the hair follicle. So what makes a hair follicle? Now, understanding the anatomy of the hair follicle is crucial in looking at palinatal disease because while palinatal disease was once thought to be a congenital problem, we now know that it's actually an acquired condition. And it's a condition associated with the hair follicle. So let's look at this anatomy. The hair follicle itself has an upper portion, which is called the infundibulum. So that's right below the skin, down to the sebaceous gland. You then have the isthmus, which is the middle part of the follicle, and that runs from the sebaceous gland down to the erector pili muscle. And then we have the bulb, or the lower follicle, and that is down in the subcutaneous fat layer. All right, now, of these three layers, which one is most important when it comes to pilonidal disease? Well, it's the infundibulum. So the infundibulum, that first layer just below the skin, is where we can get blockage of the follicle, and that can result in inflammation and buildup of debris in that follicular shaft. So when that follicle gets blocked, we can get the formation of a pilonidal pit. That looks something like that right there, okay? So that would be the very early stage of pilonidal disease. But let's back up a minute. Why would a follicle, why would the infundibulum part of the follicle get blocked? Well, the natal cleft, the gluteal cleft, some people would even call this the butt crack, okay? It is a humid, warm, and high friction environment, especially in people that have a deeper natal cleft. So think about it. Now we have hair. That can be from the back of the head. That could be from the back in some people. That could even be from the natal cleft gets trapped in the natal cleft, the gluteal cleft, okay? And then we have friction. 
Friction can be from walking. Friction can be from sitting for long periods. Friction can be from riding on hard surfaces or being in a Jeep, or friction can even come from high activity and exercises. And what happens is this shed hair gets stuck in this humid, high friction environment, and it starts causing micro trauma, and those little hairs get sucked into that palinidal pit. Once those hair fragments pierce the skin and get trapped beneath it, they form this hair nest, which is now a foreign body that is contaminated and the body mounts an immune response to get rid of it. And what do we get? We get the formation of a polynial pit or multiple pits and eventually even a polynial abscess, which is a collection of infected fluid that will either drain on its own or will require surgical drainage. Now, what's the next stage of polynial disease? We have our deep natal cleft, that's humid, high friction environment, the shed hair pierces the skin, we get the formation of the pilonidal pit or multiple pits, well what's next? First is we get enlargement of that pilonidal pit. So as it becomes enlarged, we get more keratin, more debris, more hair that gets sucked into that pit, okay, and that causes enlargement and we're gonna call that now a polynidal sinus. Now a sinus is an abnormal narrow tunnel which begins usually at the site of a deep infection or inflammation and proceeds outward to the skin. So we have the pit, the pit now enlarges into this sinus tract. If we get occlusion of that pit and development of fluid that gets infected below, as I said, we can get an abscess. Now even if it's drained, you still have that foreign body, that hair underneath, and so that's why recurrence is so high. If we don't get rid of that nest of hair, even if we give all the antibiotics in the world and drain the pus, it's still going to come back, all right? Well, what's the next stage? What happens next? Next is we get formation of secondary tracts. So think of this like an anthill. When we look at an anthill, we can see an ant going right in the top, all right? But underneath is a complex network of tunnels that are going all around. And if we have an abscess formation and we have inflammation, we have a foreign body, well, that fluid is going to find other ways to get out and release the pressure. And that's where we can get fibrosis, chronic inflammation, and very complex palinidal disease. Now that we have a good understanding of palinidal disease, let's get into the risk factors. So who is at risk for palinidal disease and recurrent palinidal disease? Well, there are a lot of factors. First is hair factors, okay? We're going to talk about hair. So people that have coarse, thick hair. That's why this is more common in adolescents and young people ages 20 to 30, especially men, but women do get this as well, because in that age and specifically in men, the hair is more coarse and thick. People who are hirsute or have more hair, especially on the back and the natal cleft, have an increased risk of getting palinidal disease. And of course, those with loose and shed hairs, those hairs get trapped in that natal cleft and cause micro trauma. The second risk factor are those with a deep natal cleft or a deep butt crack, all right? Especially if that is deep and tight because that's gonna trap hair and cause more micro trauma. Third is lifestyle and occupational risks. Okay, so palinidal disease is more common in people that have prolonged sitting. So truck drivers, even students, okay? So sitting for a longer time causes more micro trauma in that natal cleft. Having obesity or a high BMI, that leads to a deeper natal cleft. There's more sweating in there, so more humidity and more opportunities for micro trauma and hair penetration into the skin. The fifth factor is excessive sweating. So if you are a heavy sweater, if there is more moisture in the natal cleft, if we're wearing tight clothes that are gonna increase friction, that also increases the risk of polynidal disease. Six is familial risk. So some people have a tendency to have a deeper natal cleft or 
a deeper butt crack. And it's it's not your fault. It's just your family's fault, okay? It's just the way you're built. And the last risk factor is previous episodes of polyneural disease. So if we've had an episode of abscess or a chronically draining sinus, the risk of getting a future episode is much, much higher. And that's because of all those tunnels and epithelialized tracts that develop when we get advanced pyelonidal disease. All right, let's step into just the first step in treatment. What do you think that is? Well, if we look at all the risk factors, which ones can we change? Well, the most obvious thing that we can change is hair. All right, and so this is a recent publication from the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it was looking at conventional good hygiene with shaving or hair clipping versus laser depilation or laser hair removal. And what this study found is we can get a significantly decreased recurrence rate if we do laser depilation. So what is conventional treatment? If I have somebody that comes in with early polyneidal disease, so we have an uninflamed polyneidal pit, I'm going to recommend that we do hair removal, and that is usually in the form of hair clipping or shaving. We can also use creams for hair removal. We can use waxing for hair removal, or we can use laser depilation. I also recommend keeping that area clean and doing a sitz bath daily or at least several times a week. Sitting in that bathtub is going to allow us to clean that deeper natal cleft, the deep butt crack, all right, and get all of that shed hair out, all right. Also, get sweat, debris, and other things that build up. So at the end of the day, if somebody has a shower with a bathtub and they're a shower person, I recommend turning the shower on and then for the last couple of minutes, let about four or five inches of soapy water develop in the bath and sit in there for 10 minutes, agitate the natal cleft, get that shed hair out. And that is the first step in treatment for polyneidal disease. Now, when we look and we say, well, what is laser epilation, is it worth the investment? Because this is expensive, all right? And the JAMA paper would suggest that we can get as low as a 10% recurrence rate compared to over 20% if we do laser depilation. And that is a laser hair removal treatment separated by several weeks and in the uh, interim time, doing shaving and good hygiene, okay? And so if we do laser depilation, we can decrease that recurrence risk. And I think that that is a tremendous advantage when we are treating polyneidal disease. All right, and then in the next video, I'm gonna be getting at the whole treatment strategy. How do I treat polyneidal disease and what are the most advanced topics? We're gonna to talk about non-operative therapies. We're going to talk about endoscopic therapies. We're going to talk about pit picking. We're going to talk about flaps. You might have heard about the Caridacus flap or the Limburg flap or what I use, the Bascom flap. We're going to talk all about that next time. If you're looking for a video to go to from here, I would definitely check out the wound healing video. So you can check out Wound Healing 101. You can also check out my video on best dressings for wound healing where I go through passive dressings, active dressings, I go through alginates, I go through hydrocolloids, I go through collagen dressings, silver dressings, the whole works. And so that's a great intro to dressings, wound care, and wound healing. I hope you found this helpful. As always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.